White people love playing divide and rule. We should not play their game. Hashtag tactic as old as colonialism. So said Diane Abbott, the Member of Parliament for Hackney, in a conversation with the journalist Bim Adewumni on Twitter on the 5th of January 2012. These words the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg denounced as stupid and crass generalisation. For its part, the Labour Party distanced itself from Abbott's uh, remarks, saying, we disagree with Diane's tweet. It is wrong to make sweeping generalisations uh, about any race, creed or culture. Focus on two words in Labour's statement, not sweeping generalisations, but any race. The Labour Party seems to believe that there are races, just as there are creeds and cultures, about which sweeping generalisations could but should not be made. Races do not exist. But racism does. Racism exists because our society spins a silly story, a false and fatal fable, in which it refers to things it likes to call races. Similarly, white people do not exist. But white power does. White power exists because our society spins a silly story, a false and fatal fable, in which it refers to things it likes to call white people. <laughs> in our society, racism just is white power. Had Abbott referred not to white people, but rather to white power, the truth of her tweet might have been more readily grasped. Abbott might not, had she done this, been so stupidly and crassly misrepresented. Yet such is the impoverishment of British public discourse on matters of race that there is a great need for us to enrich public discourse. In what follows, I shall argue that the new discipline of critical eugenics can help us to enrich public discourse on matters of race and can thereby help us to grasp the truth of Abbott's tweet. Critical eugenics interrogates the origins, histories, and legacies of national eugenics here at UCL. And it does so in a race-critical, white-critical way. Origins encompasses all factors, social, cultural, economic, political, and academic, that occurred between 1492 and 1904 and can be shown to have had some causal relationship with the invention and institutionalization of national eugenics at UCL in 1904. Purposefully broad, this embraces European competitive colonization and the creation and contestation of whiteness. Histories encompasses all develops, developments in the newly institutionalized discipline that occurred between 1904 and 1963 when the Francis Galton Laboratory for the Study of National Eugenics was renamed the Galton Laboratory of the Department of Human Genetics and Biometry. Legacies encompasses all the consequences of the now defunct discipline that occur from 1963 through 2026, the year of UCL's bicentenary, uh, to 2034, the, UC, the year of UCL's strategic plan, and beyond. Now, there are many scholars here at UCL who are currently engaged in groundbreaking research, teaching, and public engagement on critical eugenics at UCL. Dr. David Chalice, Dr. Carol Reeves, Subhadra Das, to name but three. What I am about to share with you today is merely one example of the sort of publicly beneficial work that could be researched, taught, and uh, in which we could engage the public if UCL decides that it believes facing up to its invention and institutionalization of national eugenics, and crucially to the, all the legacies of those wrongful actions, is something worth 
prioritizing and paying for. It is not inappropriate to mention at this juncture that UCL has already lost out to a competitor university, a Russell Group uh, member, on the opportunity to show leadership in our industry by opening Britain's first centre for research in race and education, with Britain's first and only professor of critical race studies, David Gilborn, author of this book. After his 20 years of race-critical, white-critical research teaching and public engagement at UCL Institute of Education, we failed to hold on to David, as well as to his race-critical and white-critical colleagues, Professor Heidi Safia Mirza, Professor Deborah Udell, and Dr. Nicola Rollock. They all went to conduct their radical, race-critical, white-critical rework at a braver, more ambitious university. My argument will proceed in three parts. Manipulating the model minority. Africa for the Chinese. Unite against white. Part one, manipulating the model minority. In their article, Divide and Conquer, Eric A. Posner, Catherine E. Speer, and Adrian Vermeule distinguish between two kinds of imperial divide and conquer policy, sowing mutual mistrust and selective bribery. These two policies are preferred by the imperialists because they are cheaper than all-out conflict against a unified opposition. Now let us focus upon what they call discriminatory offers to split the opposition. Not least because this is itself one way in which to sow the seeds of mistrust <laughs> among oppressed categories of people. Now the key bribe selectively offered by the imperialist is higher social, relatively higher social rank in the imperialist's social hierarchy. The bribe that the British imperialist offers to those persons the imperialist racialises as Chinese is the relatively higher social rank of model minority. The model minority thesis says David Gilborn in his book Racism and Education, Coincidence or Conspiracy, suggests that Asian Americans, particularly those of Japanese and Chinese ethnic heritage, provide a model of hard work, family stability, and self-sacrifice that illustrates the best way any migrant community to, uh, for any migrant community to achieve social mobility by taking advantage of all the freedoms and opportunities available to them in the USA. In a chapter published in 2004 entitled Social Science Research on Asian Americans, Pyong Gap Min even concludes that the model minority thesis is probably the most frequently cited concept in the Asian American school science literature over the past two decades. Asian American scholars, Gilborn tells us, are among the sternest critics of the model minority thesis. They argue that, one, it oversimplifies the experiences and achievements of Asian Americans by ignoring areas of inequality and deep-rooted disadvantage. Two, it is detrimental to Asian Americans themselves, not least because it masks their own experience of racism and marginalization. Three, it operates to the detriment of other minoritized groups who are demonized and scapegoated as poor reflections of the Asian American stereotype. Crucially, Gilborn argues that each of these criticisms can be equally applied to the popular image of Indian and Chinese success in the UK. One, British Indian and Chinese groups are much more diverse and complex groups than is usually assumed here. Two, in the UK, the mere fact of minority success is positioned as if, it, as if it automatically disproves the charge of racism against any and all minoritized groups. 
Three, comparisons are made with underachieving groups so that the latter are cast as deficient and even dangerous. As evidence for points two and three, Gilborn quotes commentators in the British press, for example, I quote, the infamous definition produced by the McPherson report inquiry into the murder of Stephen Lawrence is demonstrably ridiculous here. For the report shows that while Bangladeshi and black Caribbean children do worse than white children, Indian and Chinese children do very much better. It is a strange kind of institutional racism that actually favours some ethnic minorities. That was Melanie Phillips in the Sunday Times in 1999. Gilborn's reply to Phillips is that racists have always played favourites. Viewing some groups as exotic, mysterious and alluring, while others are seen as bestial, savage and threatening. The same processes are, are at play in contemporary classrooms and staff rooms. The exceptionally high expectations that many teachers hold about Indian and Chinese students are the flip side of the very same coin that involves the demonization of black students. Part two, Africa for the Chinese. On the 5th of June, 1873, Francis Galton wrote a letter to the editor of the Times. The letter consisted of five paragraphs. Structurally, the fourth and fifth paragraphs work together, so we may divide the letter into four parts. The proposal, followed by what I shall call the model of rend, rank, rule. I offer the model of rend, rank, rule as a more fine-grained analysis of the much misunderstood phrase divide and conquer or divide and rule. Crucially, this enriching analysis arises from a race-critical and white-critical reading of a key eugenicist text. Galton's proposal is to make the encouragement of the Chinese settlements at one or more suitable places on the east coast of Africa a part of our national policy, in the belief that the Chinese immigrants would not only maintain their position, but that they would multiply and their descendants supplant the inferior Negro. Our national policy. Uh, the word our should raise a red flag. Who are we? Uh, Galton does not reveal who we are until the third part of his letter when he refers to the Anglo-Saxon race. Uh, this is policy making from a white perspective. In fact, given the model upon, it which, upon which it relies, it is clear that this is policy making from the perspective of white power. The European imperialist does not merely divide his opposition before he rules over them. On the contrary, humanity is unified. Let me repeat that. Humanity is unified. Thus, there is no mere division. The very fabric of humanity is ripped apart. Recognising that humanity is unified, the imperialist rends humanity apart, then crucially ranks those parts beneath him, and only thereafter rules over what he has rent and ranked. On this model, to rend is to engage in stigmatising differential racialization. To rank is to set up a competitive racialised hierarchy. To rule is to enjoy white interest convergence. Galton rends what he calls the Chinaman with his supposed remarkable aptitude for high material civilization with what he calls average Negroes who supposedly possess too little intellect, self-reliance and self-control to make it possible for them to sustain the burden of respectable form of civilization without a measure of external guidance and support. 
Galton writes these two fantasies, these false and fatal fables, in a hierarchical, competitive fight to be white, which Galton disingenuously refers to as a free, fri- a free fight among all present. Finally, Galton represents the wished-for outcome of the policy as one that is, quote, of equally great value to all. Again, this is disingenuous, since in this model, the bribe of model minority, status is being extended to the Chinaman only because doing so converges with the interests of white power. Now, when Galton coined, uh, wrote this letter, he had not yet coined the English word eugenics, and Galton had not yet got together with the principal of the University of London to invent and institutionalise the new academic discipline of national eugenics. Galton did the former action ten years later, in 1883, defining eugenics as the science of improving stock by giving to the more suitable races of the strains of blood a better chance of prevailing speedily over the less suitable. Galton collaborated with us here at UCL to, uh, on the latter action some 40 years later in 1904, when our institution worked with him to co-produce the following definition of national eugenics the study of the agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. Upon his death some 50 years later in 1911, Galton bequeathed his enormous estate to us here at UCL, on condition that we establish with it Britain's first and the world's first and only professorship of eugenics and that we give this professorship to his most loyal disciple and acolyte, Carl Pearson. Without batting an eyelid, we took Galton's money and we did everything that he asked. In 1912, discussion at UCL turned to the question of where UCL would house the new lavish laboratory of the new professor. Now, explaining his decision on this question, Carl Pearson, uh, to Carl Pearson, the chairman of the college committee at UCL, Donald James Mackay, the 11th Lord Ray, wrote, The Galton Committee, by their resolution, expressed a preference for the gymnasium site, with a possible extension by the acquisition of houses into Gordon Square. The College Committee have given that proposal the most careful consideration, not only because it came from the Galton Committee, but more especially because it emanated from you, who have been so long connected with the college and have rendered it such loyal service. Indeed, Ray reassured Pearson that throughout the whole of the negotiations for the creation of the Golden Chair, the college committee has done its utmost to meet your views and your desires. Although Ray did not grant Pearson what he wanted, he nevertheless added that, quote, I may tell you confidentially, but I think it is highly probable that the anonymous donor will complete the Northwest Wing, thereby providing adequately and completely for eugenics. Unquote. Behind the scenes, Ray successfully negotiated £30,000 from Sir Herbert Bartlett to build, for national eugenics at UCL, the building immediately behind me. It's called the Pearson Building. This is the same Ray who wrote between 1907 and 1909 the Ray Report, or the Report of the Treasury Committee on the Organisation of Oriental Studies in London, which led in 1916 to the founding of the School of Oriental Studies. As Chia Mei Jane Coughlin puts it in her book, The Study of China in Universities, a comparative case study of Australia and the United Kingdom, the value of getting to know the East was largely translated by the Ray Report into the, a more functional definition of to rule and to trade. I think we can discern the manipulation of the minority, uh, model minority in Ray's report for the purposes of securing and stabilising imperial rule of white power. 
In his report, Ray notes that the inadequacy of native teachers of native languages was insisted upon from personal experience by nearly every witness for who appeared before the committee. This was a justification for placing the teaching of those languages in the hands of British persons, racialized as white. As Sir Charles Lyell, a witness for the committee, put it, the aim was to furnish the British businessman or imperial administrator with a grounding in this country given by teachers of his own race. However, there was one exception. With regard to Chinese and Japanese and other languages using the Chinese character, opinion is perhaps somewhat more evenly divided among the ex experts in the language. For example, Ray quotes Sir John McLeavy Brown, who, when asked whether it would be impossible for a student to acquire the tones here in Britain, replied, if he has a Chinese teacher, no difficulty whatsoever. Third and final part, unite against white. While the divide and conquer strategies pursued by imperial and colonial powers are often successful in the short run, they can, say Posner, Speer, and Vermeule, be self defeating in the long run. The presence of the dominant power and the very fact that it is known to use divide and conquer tactics both tend to create emotions of solidarity among oppressed groups, unifying the opposition. My appeal to you is as follows. Don't fight to be white. Unite against white power. On the one hand, it would seem that persons racialized as African and persons racialized as Chinese are apt to fall for the white manipulation of the model minority. For instance, in Guangzhou in China, where many immigrants from Africa have settled, there are news reports about conflict between the African community and the local police. And although in English there are more positive stories about families racialized as mixed in Guangzhou and the future of children racialized as mixed, a search in Chinese about the topic directs one mainly to stories regarding crime, confusion, illegal, drugs, flirtatious. On the other hand, here in Britain earlier this month, the British Chinese project collaborated with Operation Blackfoot, OBV, in Liverpool Central. Together they signed up local Liverpudlians to register to vote on OBV's registration bus. The bus went to Liverpool Central, Toxteth, and Liverpool Chinatown. Is this what we should hope for from African Chinese cross categorical solidarity? No. I think that this would be to set our sights far too low. We should, I think, look to the social movement that grew up last year in the USA, but which does not yet seem to have been established a foothold either in China or here in Britain. Seeding Change, a center for Asian American movement building, has an extensive web page listing Asian American solidarity statements and articles in support of hashtag Black Lives Matter. They say, with the grand jury non-indictment of the police killings of Mike Brown and Derek Garner, Asian Americans across the country have been on the streets expressing our solidarity and having the deep and necessary conversations in our community. From San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles to Madison, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Providence and D.C., Asian Americans have been showing up and busting up the model minority, which is used to maintain white supremacy, anti-blackness, and capitalism. We need a model minority mutiny. We compiled the statements and articles on Asian Americans in solidarity with Black Lives Matter as a resource tool for activists and organizers. We've been taking stock of a tactic as old as colonialism. If we want, and we should want this, to dismantle the British colonial project, we must not, and we must avoid any temptation to fight to be white. We need to unite against global white hegemony. We need the hashtag British Chinese for black lives. In closing, let us return to the misrepresented and manipulatively misunderstood Member of Parliament for Hackney. 
White power loves playing divide and rule. We should not play its game. Hashtag tactic as old as eugenics.